Gaza again under siege. The brutal cycle of violence continues as Israel retaliates and vows to eliminate Hamas. But to what end? With thousands of lives in Israel and Palestine already lost, will another assault on Gaza stop further attacks or breed a more dangerous desire for revenge? I'm Andrea Sankey, and this is The Newsmakers. It is shocking, it's gut-wrenching, and it is disturbingly set to continue as images of the dead and detained pour out of Gaza and Israel. Gaza is now under an intensified blockade as Israel seeks to avenge last weekend's Hamas attack. But even if retaliation can be justified, what end does it serve if the occupation of Palestine continues and further revenge will be sought? We'll debate that in just a minute, but first, a look at where this conflict stands now. Israel has vowed to destroy Hamas as the Palestinian group continues to fire rockets from Gaza. Israeli troops retook towns near the Gaza border on Tuesday following a Hamas attack that killed hundreds of Israelis. The army has called up 300,000 reservists, amassing troops, tanks and heavy armored vehicles near the Gaza fence in preparation for a ground offensive. That is to make sure that Hamas, at the end of this war, that won't have any military capabilities by which they can threaten or kill Israeli civilians. That is our military aim. Israel has also intensified airstrikes on Gaza, targeting residential areas, mosques, schools and hospitals. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians have been forced to flee their homes. We escaped from being targeted and came to another targeted place. As you can see, there is no safe place in the Gaza Strip. And on Monday, the Israeli Defense Ministry announced a complete siege of the territory. There will be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything will be closed. We are fighting against human animals and we are acting accordingly. Already under the Israeli blockade for nearly two decades, 2.2 million Palestinians rely on supplies and aid coming from outside. Now. Gaza is on the brink of total humanitarian collapse. Its only operating power plant shut down after running out of fuel, and hospitals are short of medicines. Human rights groups say the blockade is a war crime, and the UN called on warring parties to respect international law. Medical equipment, food, fuel, and other humanitarian supplies are desperately needed, along with access for humanitarian personnel. Relief and entry of essential supplies into Gaza must be facilitated and the UN will continue efforts to provide aid to respond to these needs. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Netanyahu said Israel's response to the Hamas attack is going to change the Middle East. And the first plane carrying US ammunition landed in Israel on Tuesday after President Joe Biden pledged additional military supplies. Let there be no doubt. The United States has Israel's back. We will make sure the Jewish and democratic state of Israel can defend itself today, tomorrow, as we always have. On Monday, a senior Hamas official said its allies are ready to join the fight if Israel launches a war of annihilation on Gaza. The government of Israel knows they will open the gates of hell if they try to destroy Gaza and use non-traditional weapons, like American weapons. The Houthis in Yemen and Iran allies in Iraq said they will target U.S. interests with drones and missiles if Washington directly involves in the conflict. And Lebanon's Hezbollah has weighed in, firing rockets after an Israeli shelling killed three of its fighters. Cross-border exchanges raise concern that the conflict will open up on a second front. In a possible de-escalatory move, Qatar, in coordination with the U.S., is holding talks with Hamas and Israel for a prisoner swap. At the moment, any such breakthrough seems a long way away. Well, joining me now to talk about any prospects for resolution of this latest escalation are from Ramallah, former spokesperson for the Palestinian government and writer Noor Odeh. 
And from West Jerusalem, author and former speaker of the Israeli Knesset, Avram Borg. Thanks both so much for being with me. Noor, I'll begin with you. You know, last time we spoke, after the Hamas-Israel ceasefire in 2021, we said that we've been here before, we've seen this all before, and the same miserable cycle and fighting will likely continue and that fighting will break out again. And here we are. But did you yeah, expect it... an attack on this scale? And does its brutality in any way serve the greater Palestinian good or just sentence Palestinians to worse? Well, I mean, the, the scale and the proportion of everything that's happening is, um, is epic. Uh, but unfortunately, um, like we said, uh, um, we expected this to repeat because nobody was interested in making sure it doesn't. Nobody wanted to change anything on the ground. And uh, everybody up until now is concerned with the status quo, with maintaining the rules of this miserable game of keeping Palestinians under lock and key and keeping them under control, uh, maybe sending some assistance their way, but without offering them any horizon, all the while expecting that all the brutality that they endure on a daily basis from this occupation won't. Uh, suddenly erupt and explode in this uh, uh, um, shocking way uh, one day, as it has now. Um, so, you know, it's not about whether it advances the cause of the Palestinian people or not. I don't think that's really the issue. It's it's mm. it's about, I would hope, I would have hoped that this was a waking, wake up call, uh, that, you know, brutality day in and day out will only create uh, more of the same. Yeah, wake-up call, is, as I said before, could be, I don't know, silver lining seems too trivial a, a term to use right now. I, I don't know what else to say. But Avram, you know, Israel now says in this phase of this miserable cycle that it will end Hamas once and for all. But then what? Will the occupation end? Since I do not stand for this government, and I think it's almost illegitimate illegit government, I cannot defend any of its empty, hollow rhetoric. I know that the situation is such that the Palestinian cause is right. The fact that the Palestinians would like to have freedoms and liberties and independence and self-definition the same way as my people want, it's a very legitimate and makes sense demand. Whatever happened in the last five days is not legitimate and it's not acceptable. These kind of atrocities actually, from a point of view of an average Israeli, made the potential reconciliation even further. The situation is such that we are now in the first couple of days of a vicious circle of revenge and bloodshed. Your blood, my blood, my blood, your blood. And the question is actually in the day after. The problem is that at least from the Israeli side, I do not stand for the Palestinian one here, nobody talks about the day after and nobody is ready for the price of the day after. But, and this is the beauty of history, there is a day after and there will be a day after. So in that day after, I mean, we can say that these actions we've seen over the past five days, as you said, they're not legitimate, but they have happened. So as for the day after, will you expect, Avram, whether you like it or not, Israelis to rally around Netanyahu and right-wing leaders who will show absolutely no mercy for the cause of Palestinians? Definitely not. Revenge is not a policy. Bloodshed of innocent people is not a replacement for a bloodshed of innocent people. And if the government goes after innocent civilians in Gaza, and there are innocent civilians in Gaza, I do not accept it as an Israeli. I accept going after Hamas soldiers and after Hamas leadership this way or that way, but not a massive demolition the way that goes now. I mean, I stand against it. When I say this, the future of Netanyahu is decided. He will not be a prime minister for long. I don't know how long will it take him, but like previous prime ministers, excuse my language, who in times of war, he will be removed, he will be impeached. And the question is not necessarily the popularity of this hollow, pompous, 
arrogant, disconnected individual who tried to escape from jail. But the question is, what should be the fate of both nations? And my feeling is that the conversation should be that Israelis should overcome its own extremists who are now running the government. The Palestinians should come overcome its own extremists. And it will be a conversation, very tough one, mm. but between mm -hmm. potential moderates rather than between expressed extremists. Abram, I appreciate what you're saying, and you you can tell us that you know Netanyahu will not last, but he is there now. And as we know, when these leaders are in power, the damage they do can last. So, Noor, let me come back to you. The leadership at present is saying that they will teach Hamas a lesson in this retaliation in Gaza. What could Hamas actually learn? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'll tell you the dynamics between oppressed and oppressor and the way we've seen it play out, not just in Palestine, but elsewhere. When the oppressed are crushed, are bombarded, are uh, um, uh, you know attacked with such viciousness, the only lesson that, the, uh, um, that they learn is that they need to fight more. Uh, and that's why, you know, unleashing Israel's uh, uh, awesome firepower uh, on Gaza, uh, for me, only means that this will entrench everybody uh, uh, in the same position they are. What happened, like I said, was epic in, in, in every sense of the word. It was unprecedented. And yes, it will scar all of us. Uh, uh, for a very long time, and it will make any conversation harder. And that's why it is so regrettable that international intervention has been so lazy and irresponsible. It's been much of the same. Nobody wants to say what the, the most difficult things to say. Nobody wants to do what needs to be done because it's inconvenient, because it requires a much more honest conversation than, than we've had in the past 30 years. And if you look at similar situations of injustice, of prolonged injustice, of countries that were so strong economically and militarily, uh, without world intervention, they would have continued to do that. I mean, apartheid South Africa didn't stop being apartheid because it suddenly woke up and decided that that was the wrong thing to do. There was real international pressure that pushed it in the right direction. We, we never saw that, not in the past 30 years. What we see are more carrots. What we see is pandering. What we see is America spending political capital to make sure that Israel gets the crown jewel of all jewels, uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia. And with whom? With this government, this government run by Netanyahu, full of, you know, the most the most extreme uh, elements in Israel, in the Israeli political system, the people who Israelis can't tolerate, people who have pronounced their intention to crush mm. Palestinian hopes for statehood. So I, you know, what I see moving forward, if we continue to see much of the same, is just more tragedy. Mm. I, I fear, um, you know, that wiping out Gaza, wiping out all of these neighborhoods, even killing uh, most of, of Hamas's leadership is not going to change the dynamics. It will just give them more. It will, will give everybody more, more stories mm. of sorrow and more pain to build on. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you don't make peace with friends, you make peace with, with enemies. enemies. Indeed. I mean, and, since, and something since has to give. Yeah. But, and since you've raised uh, international intervention, Avram, is anyone in a position to mediate negotiations here? I mean, just a few weeks ago, you know, we talked about Saudi Arabia being that facilitator somehow, and today it's being said that Saudi-Israeli reconciliation was actually a factor in this Hamas attack. Qatar is, is supposedly involved in talks now with Hamas. I mean, is there a clear player here that could facilitate a breakthrough? Andrea, it's a bit too early. It's a bit, I mean, not for the individual uh, persecuted in the streets of Gaza or in the streets of southern uh, Israel, but it's too early politically and diplomatically. First, we have to put hold 
to the atrocities and to the countermeasures. But here I would, and then to look for potential uh, potential in-betweeners. But a couple of words about what No just said. I really, really appreciate the moderate way she describes the situation. Israel is saturated with a government of racists. And the only way we can move on with this Israel, with these Palestines, because we do not have just one Palestine, we have at least two Palestines, is to remove our racists from power and to do something about their religious fundamentalists. So a conversation between no and myself might be very, very difficult, but possible. Mm. A conversation between our racists and their fanatics is impossible. Now we are in a new situation. It's a new page. At what sense? Israel, it was proven in the past, is very, very good to respond eventually to traumas. We never do the first day what we have to do at the last day. But once a trauma occurs, we respond. And this trauma of that side, we never had. Never, never, never. Mm. And it's an opening for something. On the other hand, the Palestinians, through the vehicle or through the agents of Hamas, got an achievement that nobody in the Arab world had since 48 and on. So it's a one achievement on one hand, and it's a one trauma on the other hand. It's a potential for something. Who would walk in with this achievement and this trauma? I think it should be a combined international force, but this time not only the one-sided Americans, which are one-sided to our side, mm -hmm. and not only the very weak and very sometimes pathetic Europeans, but a combination of Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Saudi, and, and, the, and the Egyptians on one hand, plus the West on the other hand, as an international intervention force to force the sides to come to the table. And if the sides include Hamas one way or another, it's a conversation that we have to hold. It's impossible to continue the conversation as if the elephant is not in the room, but the elephant crashes the room. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Nora, I can see you agree. I mean, do you have anything to add to that? Do you think there is perhaps, I mean, I, I made the question quite precise, and I don't know if it's possible to ever answer it in those terms at this point. Uh, but is there someone you feel could have more leverage, that uh, a, an international player that could come to the table and actually break the deadlock of, of decades? I, I'm not sure there's one person who can do that. I think we need a combination of things, like uh, uh, Abraham said. And I think that without an international momentum that makes everybody understand that there's only one way forward, and that one way doesn't involve pandering. It doesn't involve candy, right? There's the the, the candy has to be only at the finish line uh, when uh, an end to the root cause is reached, uh, but but not not in between. Mm. Um, and, and that would be a departure from the trend of years past. Um, and and that would require everybody to change. Uh, perspective, everybody to change their understanding of what it would take uh, to stop, you know, uh, uh, um, this from not just this from happening again, but to understand that maintaining the status quo will lead to disaster, even worse than what we're seeing now. You, you know, pr a predominantly young Palestinian population that sees absolutely no end in sight, mm. that sees the political leadership that keeps talking about negotiations being humiliated and made to look pathetic and irrelevant. What exactly do the Europeans and the Americans think will be the consequence of that? I mean, what, what do they expect the outcome of that would be? Yeah. Nothing but disaster. There has to be a, for, a, a way forward that is clear, that is honest, uh, at, politically speaking, in understanding what needs to be done and not beating around the bush, not maintaining the Palestinians on the back burner, not bribing them with with assistance in exchange for their silence, because that is going to become increasingly more difficult. Yeah, Avram, go ahead. Two things. The first is, it's not time for clowns. When an idiot like President Trump 
nothing less than a clown and an idiot, said, I put Jerusalem off the table. I solve the, am solving the Palestinian problem. He actually intensified the challenge yeah. because the despair of the people, the lack of hope, the no future, the no tomorrow is something that no golden hairstyle president can change without changing the reality. So the one thing we do not know is more idiots. It's, yeah, I mean, you said it, the leaders are temporary, but the damage is lasting, Avram. Yes, uh, uh, yes, some of the idiots threat to come back. Yeah, uh, they do, and that's what so f makes this whole process feel so exactly. hopeless in the end. Second, you the had second, a sec, go ahead, yeah. And the second thing is, we are living in an era of irresponsible politics which is a very interesting uh, era all over the world. And if the responsible leaders of the West, and not only the West, of the region as well, will not understand that the precedent that is happening nowadays between Israel and Palestine will trickle into their societies, unless they will walk in and create a more comprehensive equilibrium one day we shall sit here and not very far and we shall explore the spring offs mm. of this mm. Gaza Israel invasion in other places and we shall say, why didn't we do something about it? The time to prevent the trickling in of this precedent is now. Okay. So in an okay. international intervention in the region is not just for us and Palestines, it's for the well-being and for the equilibrium of the entire Western civilization. You know, I, I, I want, you, you made an interesting point saying, you know, conversations between extremists, which are now on both sides, is, is not possible. Negotiation would not be possible. So I want to look at the language that Israel in particular is using right now. For example, it is, has said that it's fighting human animals. Okay, let's flip that analogy then. You know, fine, you, you cage and you torture an animal. That animal is no, going no, no, to no. attack in no. any way it can against no. whomever it can. No. I mean, it seems, hold on. I mean, it seems as Israel in this sense is blaming an abused person for not behaving rationally. And, but that language is an easy sell, it seems. This is the soundbite that's playing out around the world. I refuse, at least in this conversation between the three of us, to call human beings animals. I when understand I you do, but this is the language being used. This is the kind of extreme language that's being used and that is selling the Israeli I'm, narrative around the world. I'm using my own language. I don't use somebody else's syntax. And if you call somebody an animal, it means you give him or her an excuse to behave like an animal. And I will say Hamas are human beings, maybe bad human beings, maybe with conditioned realities that led them to do it, which I do not justify and do not accept. But I treat even adversaries as human beings because that's a human challenge. The reality now is that we have two unleashed angers in both societies. So yes, it will take a while, and yes, there will be dear prices for both societies. The question is not, do we, Noor and myself, adopt this language of extremism, but can we offer a different syntax, a different grammar, a different value language for the day after in which many people will wake up and say, okay, we did it, and now what? So the conversation is much more about providing an alternative discourse rather than falling into the traps of the current malignant one. Okay, so okay. providing an alternative discourse, uh, Noor, uh, that could be everyone's dream right now, but you have to have a partner to negotiate with on both sides. If there are more moderate Israelis to be spoken to, who steps up now for the Palestinians? You used to be part of the Palestinian government. You are no longer, you know how much criticism there has been because the government is no longer respected by so many Palestinians as it once was because of corruption and because of so many other issues. Who would you like to see then on the Palestinian side, arguably come to the table and help resolve this using the language that needs to be used? 
Well, look, the, the Palestinian political system is in crisis, and it's in crisis not just because of its own shortcomings and failures, but it's uh, because it was far more convenient to keep it in crisis, right? Uh, it's a lot easier dealing with a beleaguered leadership that will do uh, what you ask it to do in order to, uh, you know, uh, stay afloat than to have a democratically elected uh, um, uh, government that is unified, uh, even if it includes uh, um, people and parties that are unsavory to the Western palate. Um, the, the resolving this division will be complex, but I think it is ab an absolute must. Uh, and I think Palestinians owe it to themselves to, to do that. I don't know when we, um, on the day after, how that will play out for Palestinians. I think it's a bit early, but I can tell you that the political landscape will be affected, will be impacted, it will be changed. Okay. Um, and I would hope that the person who can emerge from all of that uh, uh, to to or the the, the group uh, that can be emerge that can emerge and and have the trust of the people uh, would would have it as a consequence of election or at least, national consensus. But okay. that's, you know, okay. uh, very theoretical at this point. And I, I want to say that, you know, even Hamas, um, and I, I do not belong to, to any Palestinian faction, um, many, many in its uh, political offices tried, tried to show pragmatism and even tried to accept the two-state solution. Um, but it's been impossible. It's been impossible for Palestinians, even those who've given you know, all the credentials a priori before uh, uh, to to have a listening ear, a respectful listening ear um, yeah, at the international stage that would take them and 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 move with them uh, forward. Um, okay. So okay. we'll have to wait until the day after and the dust settles. Indeed. Noor, Ode and Avram Borg, that will unfortunately have to conclude this discussion. I'd like to thank you both really so much for being with me and hopefully more rational voices like both of yours will prevail. And thanks to our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.